allora l'ultima relazione del, del giorno, eh, last but not least, come si dice, eh, Tristram, Stewart, Tristram Stewart dalla Gran Bretagna. Welcome Tristram. Tristram è uno scrittore, uno storico inglese, autore del libro eh, Waste Uncovering the Global Food Scandal. Ehm, sprechi il cibo che buttiamo, che distruggiamo, che potremmo utilizzare, la traduzione. È stato tradotto in molte lingue, ha vinto lo IACP Cookbook Award, ma Tristram oggi è anche come fondatore attivista di Feedback, che è un'organizzazione basata in, in, in Gran Bretagna, appunto combatte lo scandalo dei rifiuti e si batte sul recupero di una sostenibilità piena su tutta la filiera del cibo, dal campo al piatto. Tristram. Grazie. Uh, we're starting a little bit late. How long do you really want me to talk for, Josue? Sorry? We're starting late, so do you want me to talk for less time? No, no. To take your 10-15 okay. minutes maximum. Um, uh, up on the slide, you'll see uh, some of the big international institutions of the world telling us that what we need, what we require, what we must do, what we urgently need to address is to increase global food production to meet the demands of the population that exists now, the future population of over 9 billion people by 2050, and to address the demands that arise from a shift in diet, people eating more and more meat and dairy products. We're told we need to increase food production by 60, 70, even 110%, more than doubling food production. I'd like to see a show of hands. Who has heard the message that is shown on this board, this paradigm we need to increase food production globally? Who has heard this message before today? Not everyone. Well, this is emerging as a dominant paradigm with the big international institutions. And the point I'm going to address today is that this message is wrong. This message is not just wrong, but it is the single biggest threat to global food security. The need being spoken of here can only really be interpreted as a need of corporations to turn more of nature into more food products, to sell to people at a profit beyond what they actually need, nutritionally speaking. The need, if we have one, is to protect the planet and to protect social uh, health by opposing this paradigm. That is the need. <laughs> the idea of need suggests a need for urgent action, proactive movements, effort. This increase in production is happening without effort. It's happening because there is a market that is uninhibited by the external costs of its activities. It's happening because we allow Nestle and Coca-Cola, the sponsors of Expo 2015, to sell to market, to advertise, to children, sugary drinks, fatty foods, salty foods that both harm the human health of the consumers and also harm the planets. This is proof that the last thing we need is to increase global food production. This chart, which uh, derived some, from data I produced in my book, published uh, some years ago, in Italian as Sprechi, shows every country in the world, and it gives the food availability in that country, that's the food that is available in shops and restaurants in a country, in calories, as a percentage of the requirements, the need of that population. 
So to explain more clearly, if you had a country that had what it needed and no more, it would appear right down at the bottom of this chart, near 100%, right down at the bottom. That is the need. Now, it's a good idea to have more than is absolutely needed because there will always be some waste. There will always be rich people accessing more food and poor people less. And there will be interruptions of supply. So it's a good idea to have a bit more than what you need. 130% is a secure food supply. As you can see, all rich countries in the world, in Western Europe and North America, have between 150 and 200% of their requirements. That's between one and a half and two times what they need. I can see someone shaking their head. Have I made my point clear or, or is, there a, is there a question? S shout it. Oh. It's okay? You can see it now, good. So, a country like America has twice as much what it needs already in its shops and restaurants. And of course, this is associated with a public health crisis and the environmental consequences of producing all of this food that we don't need at all. And therefore, if we're going to talk about what we need, we should address this problem. We need to cut down on overconsumption, in particular overconsumption of meat and dairy products, and we need to cut down on waste. At least one third of the world's food supply is currently wasted. And this waste is a product of the very system of cornucopian abundance. When we go into a supermarket and the shelves are piled high with food, it triggers naturally in our heads a response mechanism. We, we take from this overload. We take more than we need because there's so much there. We, we just fill our baskets with food and we take it home and then we discover that actually it's more than we can eat and then we chuck it in the bin. This is what we need to do if we need to make more food available in the world and address public health problems. And this chart actually underestimates the scale of unnecessary surplus. We've got a funny thing going on in the middle of this chart, but I'll explain roughly what this shows. At the moment, the production of meat and dairy consumption in industrial systems requires that we grow grain and soy, and we feed those to our livestock, and most of the calories in the crops are wasted as feces and as heat. It's an inefficient system. If you look at the calories that are indirectly available to populations through the grains that are fed to the livestock that they then eat as meat and dairy production, then actually what this shows is that rich countries have between three and four times the amount of calories than they need. We have never had such an enormous buffer, an enormous surplus between what we have and what we need. And therefore, addressing this problem by saying we need more, it's logic on its head. Why does it matter? In the past, we had surplus and it didn't matter. Now it matters because the way in which we increase food production is by increasing the amount of land on which we grow food. And the way in which we increase land is by doing this. We're chopping down the world's remaining forests to turn it into farmland. When I said at the beginning that increasing global food supply and production is the single biggest threat to long-term global food security, this is one of the main reasons why. We are contributing by increasing food production to climate change. And climate change threatens global, pro 
crop production. We are increasing the interruption of natural hydrological cycles by chopping down forests. And again, that undermines long-term global food security. On top of that, we are causing a mass extinction event. We are eating our way through the rest of the planet, eating habitats, and exterminating species that have evolved on this planet for four billion years. And we're doing that, why? To grow food that we chuck away and grow food that we don't need. If we have a need, it is to oppose this. One of the reasons why I was particularly pleased to be invited by Josue to speak here today is that Expo Dei Popoli, at a critical distance from the big expo out there, represents grassroots movements, the interests of people, the interests of those who are least well off in the system, least powerful in the system. And my sympathies are entirely with this grassroots organization. I myself have founded an organization that takes no money from corporations. We work in the interests of what we see as the environmental need and the need of people. We have an opportunity this year in Paris, a small, opportunity to put in place an international agreement that can start to protect forests. It's called Red Plus. It pays countries that have forests to keep them as forests instead of turning them into toilet paper and palm oil. There's something called climate smart agriculture. That's a bad word to most people in this room. We don't like climate smart agriculture because it has in it a reinforcement of the capitalist driven agricultural system. We don't like smart ag climate smart agriculture beca because it talks about genetic modification. There's a phrase in English called throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If we reject these negotiations because they are so deeply imperfect, I think we're losing off an immediate opportunity. Indeed, I think we're losing the single biggest opportunity available to us to tackle climate change and to tackle habitat loss. There's a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and the single biggest, I do not exaggerate, the single biggest opportunity to get that carbon out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground is through better agricultural practices. Agricultural practices that happen also to be agroecological practices. I'm talking about using compost instead of nitrogen fertilizer. I'm talking about leaving forests because we need them for water. I'm talking about biochar and putting that into the soil. If smallholder farmers are already doing this, these agroecological practices, it seems fair to me that I, and my fellow citizens in rich countries should compensate farmers who do that for the global good that they're doing. Climate Smart Agriculture and Red Plus are deeply, deeply flawed, but they are the best opportunity we have, I believe, for tackling climate change and improving agricultural systems around the world. I've just lost a lot of friends. I'll try and make some now. There are some things that we can all agree on, and tackling food waste, which is what I spend most of my time doing, is something that we can all agree on. Um, I'll tell you a, a little example of how justice within the food system and waste and tackling both are aligned. This is a product that I'm assuming most of you are familiar with. These are green beans, right? Supermarkets sell them. These green beans being sold in European supermarkets, there are two things on this green bean package which I want to draw your attention to. The first is the word Kenya, which of course is where these beans were grown. 
And the second is the word trimmed, which means they've been cut at both ends to take the little stalky thing at the top off, because it's not edible, and also the tail, that little wispy bit at the end, which actually is edible, but we cut it off anyway. But the funny thing about these beans is that they've been trimmed down to exactly nine centimeters to fit into this packet. The beans, they didn't know they had to be nine centimeters long, unfortunately. And so the Kenyan farmers who grow these beans for European supermarkets have to cut off 20, 30% of the length of the bean to get them into these packets. This is in a country where water and land are very scarce resources. It's a country where there are millions of hungry people. And this waste is being caused by some of the richest, most powerful companies. And they're companies that we in Europe currently pay for. We are their paymasters. We're paying for Kenyan land and water to be wasted. My organization thought this was a bit stupid. So we started campaigning on this subject. We were invited first by the United Nations to feed all the environment ministers of the world who had gathered for the UNEP governing council in Nairobi. And we fed their gala dinner entirely out of food that would have been wasted in Kenya. We organized Africa's first ever disco soup. Who here has been to a disco soup? Disco sopa. A few. Or disco jepa if you're from Brazil. Or disco soup from France or from Canada. It's a global movement and we recover food, we play music, we dance, we prepare it, and we use the food as a delicious way of communicating that food is too good to waste. We organized a Feeding the 5,000 event in Brussels. We fed 5,000 people out of food that would have been wasted, including wasted beans from Kenya. And we brought this information we had gathered in Kenya to some of the supermarkets who said, OK, this is reputational damage for us. We're going to change our bean policy. And they came back a few months later, and they say, we no longer cut the both ends. We just cut one end. So we got halfway. We're a bit more flexible with the length. This is a small thing. It's a tweak in the system. But I met one of the Kenyan farmers who produce these beans, and it's cut food waste by 30% overnight. It saves her 70,000 euros every single year. And if you transpose that onto the Kenyan market for just this one product, green beans export to Europe, it's the equivalent of 0.03% of the entire economy of Kenya, represented just by bean trimmings that can be avoided by this little thing. OK, two minutes. It's a small thing, but by exposing this kind of practice, we bring into disrepute the entire system and raise awareness that the system as we have it is unjust, wasteful, and the idea that we need to increase food production globally is insane. In sub-Saharan Africa, there may be a need for increasing production through sustainable methods for local populations. Yes, but globally, when this is going on, that's not our priority. The other measure that we took was another cause of waste for farmers both in Kenya, but also across Europe, and that is the supermarkets canceling orders at the last minute and expecting the farmer to pay the entire cost of that waste. This is 20 tons of waste being produced every day in one depot outside Nairobi airport. All of this food is edible, and it's being wasted. In the United Kingdom, in 2013, we passed a landmark piece of regulation, a new law that bans supermarkets from canceling orders at the last minute. They now have to compensate farmers for the waste they cause. There is an opportunity in Europe now to replicate that legislation to control the supermarkets and address the injustice that they currently impose upon their suppliers. This lady isn't going to harvest any of these peas. They're called mange tout. You know what mange tout means? It means eat everything. <laughs> these peas, not one single one will be eaten. 
by using waste as an expose of injustice, as an expose of environmentally destructive food practices, we attack the very heart of this paradigm that we need to increase global food production. And it's up to us, through every means available to us, starting in our own fridges, in the shops and restaurants we, where we buy our food, and the politicians that represent us. It's up to us to challenge what is currently a system that kills the planet, that causes a public health crisis, and now is the time in which we have to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose.